that's how you can tell she hasn't heard me preach before. <laughs> Last week, our focus was on how to be successful from God's point of view. How to be successful. You know, to be uh, successful in the uh, Lord's kingdom, it takes uh, trust, it takes faith. That uh, we actually believe that God's ways are better than our ways. I want to ask you today, be honest with yourself. Everybody listening? Do you believe that God's ways are better than your ways? Yeah. Right? Yeah? But when we do our own thing, what are we in fact saying? We don't really, right. God, I, I know that uh, you think impatience is wrong, but I'm just going to let her rip. God, I know that you think lust is wrong, but it feels good. God, I, I think... Uh, you know that you want me to be in prayer, read my Bible, go to church, be kind to others, all these things. But you know what? I really don't feel like it right now. In effect, we're saying, God, I think I know what's better for myself than you do. Lack of faith. Lack of faith. And yet, here we are because, honey, excuse me, thank you. Uh, here we are. And I want to, again, once again, commend you. We're here because despite all of our weaknesses and foibles and sins, why are we here? I mean, other than those who are here because they think Adam's really cute. <laughs> Bob says that's why I'm here. I'd be careful if I were you. <laughs> We're here to meet with the Lord. We're here because despite all the things that pull us down, the momentum of sin, the weight of sin, we believe God's ways are good. We believe He's good. We want to be with Him. We want to be more like Him. We think that it's better to live life God's way than our own way. Amen? Amen. And that's why we made the effort to get out of bed this morning. That's why we, we actually got in a car or walked or whatever the case is. That's why we got here, because we're putting God first, that you know, even in our weakness, we see God is wonderful. God is so wonderful. God is so good. And, Lord, uh, your family, you know, I'm praying right now, Lord, your family is not, uh, doesn't always smell good. And I'm talking about our, our sins, right? God, your family, it's a wonder that you're not more embarrassed of us. But thank you that we get to be a part of your family, Lord. Today's message is faith is more than intellectual consent. Faith is more than intellectual consent. Faith is not just checking a box. You know, you got a, a quiz. Uh, do you believe God is real? Yeah, how would everything get here? Yeah, okay, I'll check that box. Do you believe God loves you? Well, I guess if there... If God didn't love us, there'd be no such thing as love, right? It'd just be biology, chemicals, or whatever. Yeah, I, I believe love is real. That, do you believe there's right and wrong? Yeah, of course. You know, I, I can't stand the way some people treat me. That's wrong. Do you know you're a sinner? Well, nobody's perfect, right? Sure, I'll check that box. Check, 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 check. And we've ta spoken about this many times. Do you know that Satan believes in God? The Bible tells us that even the demons believe, and they shudder. They're afraid of God. I mean, just they're smarter than us in many ways. Yeah, God. But what have we said? Faith is more like falling in love than baking cookies. You don't just add this ingredient, add this ingredient, there you are. But has, has Jesus captured your heart? Has he captured your imagination, your daydreams? Do you think about God? Do you want to be close to him? Is he beautiful to you? Faith is a lot more like falling in love. 
<coughs> Has anybody ever heard of the island of Aogashima? It's, uh, it's uh, an island that's not too far from, well, it's about 200, what well, I got it written down here, 220 miles south of Tokyo, and it's part of, uh, here we go, it's actually part of the Tokyo governmental prefecture, even though it's 220 miles out in the ocean. Uh, it means uh, a blue island, and I'm guessing it's because there's beautiful blue all around. But there's actually a few hundred people that live here, and you can see there's roads all around. And uh, there's, there's uh, you can't see it here, but there's actually docks here where boats can come. There's a helicopter pad. Maybe that's it. I don't know. That's too big. Uh, but there's helicopter pads that come in here. There's these, all these right here, that's not uh, snow. That's, uh, well, maybe that's snow. I don't know. But anyways, there's a, there's a city right here. There's uh, buildings all through here. There's crops. There's fields. And uh, this is a massive volcano, right? There's a massive volcano. And here's the, what is this called? A caldera? Or, this is the inside of the volcano. And living inside the volcano, there's all these houses. And then here's another mini volcano that rose up there. And there's a name for that mountain I don't remember. I never knew about that uh, when I was living in Japan. Beautiful place. And like I said, over 200 people uh, live there. In, uh, in 1785, it's, there's, Japanese have pretty decent records going back. And from the 1600s, they, or the seven, or 1500s, they talk about, actually 1400s, talk about various earthquakes and, and disruptions. But in 1785 was the last big eruption. And prior to that, they were saying the, the lake in there was starting to steam. But in 1785, there was more people living there with the, a, fishing, a fishing community. And uh, over 300 people were living on the island, but an eruption wiped out almost half of the, of the villagers. It is absolutely, isn't that gorgeous? Wouldn't you like to just go there? Uh, you know, I've, uh, had, I've been on a couple of volcanoes in Japan. None of them were dramatic, no lava or anything like that. But I lived uh, in Japan uh, for five and a half years, Yumi and I, and that's where uh, you know, Megumi, Chi, and Aiko were made in Japan. Uh, uh, we, 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 you would walk out our front door, and you could actually see steam rising from a volcano, a, a volcanic lake uh, up in the mountains there, uh, always. Uh, but uh, we have a video, and I just want to show you how beautiful this place is. I'd like to go there someday. Look at the clouds in there. Isn't that gorgeous? Somebody's just standing on the rim looking down in there at this other, look at that. That's the wind. Hear the birds? See those buildings there? Who knew a place like this was in Tokyo, right? building right there. All those blue roofs are buildings. There's a road up in the mountains there. Thank you. I really uh, want to say thank you to our audiovisual guys who were able to get that up for me. I was figuring out, trying to think how to illustrate this, and I've often illustrated this principle with words before, but this came to me yesterday afternoon, and on the spur of the moment, I said, if you guys could get this, it'd be wonderful. So thank you, guys. Now, I want you to met. Wow, how peaceful, right? That's like paradise. No hustle and bustle. I want you to imagine that you were living on that island. Maybe you're a fisherman. Or maybe you were working one of those farm fields there, or maybe there's scientists there, I don't know. But you're living on that island. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a scientist, and I'm one of those scientists that wears the lab coat that doesn't fit quite right, and my hair is all messy, and I've got wild eyes, you know. And, and you guys, you're loving it on there. It's your little bit of paradise, your little bit of heaven. But I've developed what I say is a new way to determine when an earthquake will erupt. And, and I go around to all the villagers, you know, just 200, 
some people there, explain to you all the details of how this is going to work. And you know what? I'm actually not as crazy as I look. It kind of makes sense. And, and I'm explaining the science, and we've done some monitoring, and we've got some new equipment there. And uh, we call a town hall meeting, and uh, everybody gets together and say, you know what? I think he's right. And I, I tell you that I think the island is probably going to blow apart next Tuesday. Total disintegration. Going to sink into the ocean. And, and the town hall meeting, people one after another says, I believe this scientist, uh, you know what? I think that uh, the island is going to blow apart next Tuesday. And then uh, the next item on the agenda is the uh, children's fair on Wednesday. And you go on to talk about the children's fair on Wednesday. And with my wild eyes and big, you know, the glasses make my eyes look even bigger. And I said, wait a second, I thought you said you believed me. And everybody says, oh, we do believe you. But it makes absolutely no difference in our lives. And we're not going to change a thing uh, in life goes on as if impending doom is not coming. Would you be surprised, if you're one of those villagers, if I felt like maybe, despite your words, that faith isn't what you think it is. Trust is not what you think it is. You say you trust me, you say you believe in me, but do do you really believe in me? Is that what faith looks like? Well, let's go back to Luke now, chapter 6. Matthew, Mark, Luke. You know, you've got theists, people who believe in a God. You've got atheists, people, atheists, people who don't believe in a God. And then we've been using the term last couple of years, apatheists. Yeah, I believe in God, but I'm pretty apathetic about it. Luke chapter 6. Jesus was not after apathetic faith. Luke chapter 6 from verse 46. All those people in the village saying, you're a brilliant scientist, you're a brilliant scientist. We believe you. Let's plan the children's fair for next Wednesday. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. The people who come to me and listen to my words and put them into practice, they are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on bedrock. When a flood comes, the torrent strikes the house, but it is not shaken because it is well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete, or its destruction was great. Brothers and sisters, friends, do we believe Jesus enough to build our life on him? Are we basing the foundation of our very lives upon him and his message? Or are we like the person saying, Lord, Lord, Jesus, you're so wonderful, but it's not going to make a difference in my life. Because I'm 47, and I think I know better than you, God. You could put your own date in there. Yeah. See, when Jesus says things like, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Remember, he said that to the, the woman who anointed his feet with, with tears and perfume. He said, your faith has saved you, go in peace. He doesn't mean this hypothetical belief, which is never acted on. Remember, sometimes I tell you I don't really like the word faith because it's so spiritualized. We kind of lose our minds. Faith is this vague feeling. I want to I try to mo make a feeling come up inside of me. I believe God. Everybody believes it. Over 87% of Americans, I can tell you, they believe God, right? Jesus is not talking about this hypothetical, misty, touchy-feely kind of thing that's never acted on. Jesus is talking about belief, trust, that makes a difference in our life. You best get off that ice. It's going to crack. Trust me. Yeah, I trust you. <laughs> crack, 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 crack. You, you're going to get off? 
I think I might someday. Crack, crack, crack. You give it a go, bloop. Okay. Is that trust? How about this? Trust me. Grab my hand. I can help you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Maybe that's what trust looks like. Jesus is after faith that makes a difference. So and we've done this before, but we need to do it again because I know the way our brains work. Uh, people that are thinking theologically anyway. So are you saying we're saved by works because I have to get off that ice? Are you saying we're saved by works because I have to grab on that hand? Are you saying that I can take credit then for my salvation because I listened to the one who, who said, come on over here? Well, no way and don't be silly. None of, none of the people Jesus ministered to deserved to even stand in his presence. They didn't deserve to suck air in his presence. He was being gracious to them that he came to them and offered them this salvation. None of us are good. We're wicked. Deep down inside, we struggle with darkness. Deep down inside, we hold on to grudges, don't we? Deep down inside, we have to say, God, please free me. I don't want to be unforgiving. Deep down inside, it's so easy to be critical for other people's sins. It's so easy to make excuses for our own sins. We are wretched Be, you know, the thing about grace is it allows us to be free to be honest about ourselves. Lord, here I am with all the warts, with all the bruises. Lord, here I am because you say you love me just as I am. Lord, please take me as I am. I don't have to pretend to be something I'm not. In fact, it's very spiritually dangerous, right, to pretend we're something we're not. We are not good. God is good. That's what Jesus said. Only God is good. None of us can walk in front of God and say, look at me, I'm all that. Take me. Let me into heaven because I'm good. Let me into heaven because I'm better than those people. It doesn't work that way. God is perfect. That's why we need to take the grace and run. <laughs> Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. You know, the appropriate thing to do, say thank you. If you haven't done it yet, do it. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you say thank you? Say, please, forgive me. I know I'm messed up. I want to be a Christian. I want to be with you. I want to be with God's people. I want, to, I want to go to heaven, and I want to spend my days with you. I can't think of anything I'd rather do. Lord God, please forgive. So we're not saved by our works. We couldn't save ourselves. If we could save ourselves, Jesus would not have died on the cross. Is that, we got it? We could not have saved ourselves. No way, period. It's like, uh, you know, the old uh, Looney Tunes cartoons? You go falling off the edge of a cliff, you better have somebody who can grab you, right? In the Looney Tunes cartoons, you go falling off the edge of a cliff and you run until you realize you're not on the cliff anymore. And then some people that... You know, if you're Wiley e. Coyote, you just fall down. If you're Bugs Bunny or the Roadrunner, you just look down, you take a step over, and you get back on the cliff. Or, or, or you're drowning. You ever see Bugs Bunny drowning in water? And he's got like this, and he grabs his ears. He pulls himself out of the water. We can't save ourselves. We need somebody who's not falling off the cliff to grab a hold of us. We can't save ourselves. We are sinners. It's like we're drowning in our sins. We need somebody who's not drowning in their sins to save us because you can't pull yourself, especially if you've got short hair like me. That, does not, that is not going to work. We need somebody to come along in a boat and reach over the edge. You know, it's, I'm talking about Jesus, right? Everybody got that? He's not drowning in sin. He had no sin. And that's why he can reach over and we can grab a hold of that hand and he can save us. And are you going to, after being rescued out of that water, after you've been rescued out of the out of the burning home, after you've been pulled over back on the cliff, are you going to say, look at me, that was all me? How silly. How silly. It's like a person who ignored all the warning signs and fell into a deep pit. There's signs everywhere. Do not go this way. There's a deep pit. You go a little farther. Do not go this way. You are going to fall down, and you're not going to be able to get out. <laughs> you know? 
Do not go this way, idiot. Do not go this way, fool. Do not go this way. It's hopeless situation. Next thing you know, you're at the bottom of that pit. And then you think, well, you know, I'm pretty good. I'm just going to jump out of this pit. And if you're like me, you get about this far off the ground, you know. You jump, you try to climb, you scrabble the walls. You're not going to get out of there. You are absolutely lost. You ignored the warning signs. You've fallen into a deep pit. You cannot climb out. You cannot save yourselves. There's absolutely no hope to save yourself. But then someone who is not in our predicament, I'm not going to tell you who, but their initials are JC and it's not John Cook. Okay? Somebody not in our predicament means somebody without sin, right? And way up there, you see this little circle of light, and they're looking over the edge. How are you doing down there? Well, I'm pretty good. I'm fine the way I am. I, it's my life. I make my own choices. Here I am. You want any help? Well, no, I'm good. Boy, I'd love to help you. Who are you anyways to think that you can help me? <laughs> Go on your way. This person up at the top who wants to save us when we couldn't save ourselves then lowers a rope. He says, it's a good rope. You can trust it. And I am a strong man. And I can pull you out. Tie it around yourself. And I will pull you out of that hole. I will rescue you. I will save you. If the person at the bottom, you or me, says, you know what, on a second thought, that sounds really good. Thank you. What are you doing down there? I've been eating worms. I'm foraging. You know, going to find some. Ooh, there's a beetle. You know, I got the best food in the world up here. I've got McDonald's. Grab a hold of that rope. I can get you out. Yeah, I believe you. Ooh, grub. Why are you down there in that hole when I invited you to come out? I'm doing all I can to save you. I believe you. Just going to do my life as before. I can pull you out right now. I know. You don't get any credit for being rescued out of a hole you couldn't get out of yourself. But you've got to grab a hold of that rope. You have to have enough faith to cross that bridge, you know, the, the gap between humanity and God, and we can't get over that gap. It's too vast. But then Jesus Christ made a bridge with the cross. you got to have enough faith to get on that bridge, and it only takes a very little bit. See, it doesn't matter if your faith is great or small. Now, of course, we want to have great faith, right? But if you step out on that ice, what matters is how strong the ice is. If you grab a hold of that rope, what matters is how strong that rope is. If you're going to walk across that bridge, what matters is if it was made well. If you have just a little bit of faith and that ice is strong, it's going to hold you all the way across the lake so you can get into the warm place on the other side instead of freezing to death. You can't get to God on your own. Have enough faith to, to accept what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. You know, the other thing is also true. There's a lot of theologies out there. There's a lot of religions out there. There's a lot of politics out there. There's a lot of philosophy out there. there, are, there are, I mean, just things like hobbies. Come join our quilting club and your life will be fulfilled. Those promises will not support you no matter how much faith you have because they're weak. Because you know who made them? Humans like you and me. And they cannot sustain. The person in the hole says, sounds good, I have faith in you, but doesn't grab the rope. Do you think they're getting out? No, they're not. Jesus Christ comes to us first and says, take a hold of my hand. The Lord is not willing that any should perish. Brothers and sisters, grab a hold of God's hand. God loves you. God cares for you. And life is different with him. A person with even a little bit of faith who responds and trusts In that guy who's not down in the hole and does what they're told, that person is now in the category. They take that rope, tie it around. You know what? That rope is strong. That man is strong, Jesus Christ. They're in the category of those destined to be saved because the guy 
is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ never dropped anyone yet. You can kick and scream. He ain't going to drop you. You could pass out from exhaustion or fright. He's not going to drop you. You're not pulling yourself out of there. He is. He's the one. And when we get saved and we get lifted out of that pit, is there any room for boasting? Look at me. I've been eating grubs. <laughs> Still got a few between my teeth. Look at me. Brothers and sisters, when we bring the gospel to other people, do you know what we are? We're beggars saying we found a delicious meal. Come join us for a great meal. We're not riding in there on high horses. We're not looking like we're all that. We're not the ones who saved ourselves. We've been saved by a graceful, good, and loving God, and we better be humble. We better be humble. Let's remember who the Savior is. We're not the Savior. Let's tell people about a good Savior who will rescue them and accept them and love them with grubs between their teeth. They grab, I think he's still got a worm wriggling right there, covered in the muck of the pit, and he still puts his arms around us and says, I love you. You know what? To make the story a little better, he actually climbs down in the pit, doesn't he? And he's the one who ties that rope. Jesus Christ loves you. Jesus Christ loves you, and he wants to bring you to salvation, bring you to heaven. Hopeless and lost, we would have died for our sins in that hole if a Savior hadn't come along and had compassion on us. See, Jesus wants us to respond to his words. Jesus says, build your life on my teaching, and you will not be overwhelmed. Last week, we read about the parable of the sower. Remember, he's going out and he's tossing seeds on the side of the road. And Jesus spoke about all the bad soil. You say, yeah, I believe, yeah, that's exciting. But the sun comes out and there's no root there and it just withers. Or the birds come and they take the seed away. That's Satan coming into your life and trying to distract you and keep you from focusing on God. But some people hear the word of God and their heart is like good soil, like black earth. And the seed goes deep down in that soil and they receive it and it grows up into their life and there's a harvest in their life because of faith. Success in their life, God's style of success. But the good seed in the good soil, Jesus said, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart, or maybe he says a noble heart. And they hold fast and bear fruit with perseverance. They don't give up on their faith. They keep on keeping on. They hold on tight. Now, I want you to keep in mind, Jesus is, what we've been saying from the beginning, all of this is to establish, Jesus doesn't want you to just check a box saying you believe. Jesus wants you to build your life on him. Keep that in mind now, and we'll turn to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, from 16 to 18. Luke chapter 8, 16 to 18. <clears throat> In those days, you'd have a, a lamp that would burn with oil. And you'd be able to carry it around. You'd be able to see it at nighttime. Jesus says, no one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. What would be the point of lighting a lamp if you're going to hide the light? Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come may come in and see the light. And there are some scholars who think he's talking about Gentiles there. You go into a, a Roman home or also a Jewish home, and right when you get in, there'd be a lamp there. And now that you've come in, now you can see. Some people think he's talking about Gentiles. I don't know. He's, he's, at least he's talking to, to Gentiles as well as other people. But the idea here is that when you light the lamp, when people come near the light, they can see. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought into the open. Therefore, and what do we always say? If there's a therefore in the Bible, look and see what it's there for. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Well, you're listening to a sermon today. We're studying the words of Jesus Christ. Consider carefully how we're receiving them. Do I have good soil? Am I fighting everything I hear? Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. If you receive that blessing, there's more blessings beside. More and more blessings will come. But whoever does not have, whoever's been fighting with God, even what you think you got, you don't got. 
It will be taken away from you. You think you've got wisdom? No, you don't. You think you've got uh, your life put together? No, you don't. You think everything's put to No. If we deny the light of Jesus, we don't have anything. Brothers and sisters, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are like a lamp to our world. And you're going to be able to show people Jesus. They're going to see God as real when they get close to you. If we're living things God's way. Again, what is Jesus saying? Don't just say it. Don't just say you believe and then hide your light. Do you believe in Jesus? Let your light shine. Let your light shine so that other people can know what faith looks like. You know what? You don't need the Holy Spirit in order to hold a grudge, do you? We don't need special help from God in order to know how to abuse all of our neighbors, right? We, we, don't, need, we don't need some insight from the Holy Spirit in order to make life really bad for our husbands or our wives or our kids. But when we're hearing the words of God, and we're actually put them, putting them into practice, our light is going to shine, and people are going to see our marriages are different. People are going to see our families are different. People are going to see the church is different, and they're going to say, there's something real going on here. There's something supernatural going on here. There's something really mysterious and mystical going on here, and I want to know about this. I want to know about this. So let your light shine. Don't hide your light. And what did we talk about with the, with the children's fair, with, with the rummage sale, with the, with the, when we're giving away free food, which we're always doing, when we're, when we're uh, doing the clothes giveaway? If we don't talk about Jesus, who gets all the glory? We do. If you're a really good person, and everybody knows you're a really good person, but you never talk about Jesus, God doesn't get any of that glory. So go out. Be a kind, loving, wonderful person. Shine the light of Jesus and let people know that it's because God's made a difference in your life. Don't try to hoard God's glory. He doesn't share it with anybody. Shine the light on Jesus Christ. There's a neat passage that comes next, 19 through 21. And it's one of those things that if it wasn't in the Bible, pastors couldn't say it. Uh, remember Jesus' mother, Mary, and he had some brothers and sisters. But Now Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they were not able to get near him because of the crowd. And that such a huge crowd around Jesus, and Mary's over there, and some brothers. And someone told him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wait, wanting to see you. A different part of the Bible tells us that they thought he was crazy. His own family thought he was crazy. Maybe mom's worried he's working himself too hard. What's wrong with my boy, you know? He replied, my mother and my brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. Does anybody think today I'm overemphasizing that Jesus doesn't want to just check a box? He wants us to live out our faith. My mother and my brother, Jesus said, my family are, th are those who put into practice the words I am teaching. Lord, let that be true of us. Let that be true of us. I don't want to be just a hearer. I want to live out Faith in you, Jesus. Again, again, we're always going to be debtors to grace, aren't we? I'm not talking about stay, so we can stand proud before God and say, look at how well I've been doing. We're always in debt to that grace. But don't we want to chase after God, do things his way? Aren't God's ways better than our ways? Can we say amen to that? God, your ways are better than my ways. Amen. amen. Lots better. Jesus said, this is my family. So, brothers and sisters, I know folks who have lost family members because they came to Jesus and their family couldn't believe it, couldn't stand it. I know folks who, who thought they could depend on family members and when they had trouble, family members were not to be found. I know fam folks who have all their life depended, trusted, and then it's gone. Either death or they've been left. Your family, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, this is not what I'm saying, this is what Jesus is saying, is made up of hundreds of millions of people all around the world who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. You're not going to get to know even a small fraction of 1% of those in this life. You're not. But let's say you live a long time, you make it to 110. 
really long time, you make it to 120. Let's say you start breaking records. You're like 128. <laughs> the moment we get into heaven and start meeting our family, this big, huge, glorious family, you'll know where you belong. Those are your people. Doesn't matter if they're from Africa, doesn't matter if they're from South America. It does not matter if they're Canadian. We, we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we get a big family. Jesus Christ said, this is our true family. Our true family is people all over the globe who are putting their faith in him, who are learning to live their lives his way, that said, Lord, your ways are better than my ways. Let's finish up by looking at Luke 8, 22 through 25. And for the television and internet audience, I was joking about Canadians. <laughs> Luke chapter 8, 22 to, to the 25. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. So this was Jesus saying, let's get into that boat. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him up saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging storm. Now, Jesus Christ had to eat. He had to take a bath. He had to use the washroom. He had to sleep just like everybody else. I wonder if it was, if he got up and he's instantly awake and he says, you storm, you settle down. You waves, you settle down. Just, oh, why do you guys wave? Okay, storm, you're done. Wait, waves, you're done, you know. I don't know. I wasn't there. It's, it's a neat, neat to think about. We have a Savior, though, who is with us in the flesh, and he gave a word, whether he's wiping the sleepies out of his eyes or not, I don't know, and the storm calmed down. He got up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waters, the storm subsided, and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked the disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. You know what? This is kind of an exclamation point on this section. Why should we build on our lives on Jesus? Who is this guy? Look at This is who this guy is. This is God, and that's why we build our lives on his word. This is why we build our lives on his teaching. I, I can't study this section without hearing a song my cousin Andrew wrote. He's in Command of the Winds. Beautiful, beautiful song, great song. I, I wanted to have him come and sing it here, but uh, he's done it here for us before, but I don't know if you all remember. Sometimes I feel like one of those disciples in the storm. I know Jesus is right there with me, but I'm saying, are you just going to let me drown? Are just going to let me die? Sometimes I feel like that man. Remember the man who asked Jesus to rescue his son from demonic oppression? And, and Jesus says, have faith. He says, I do believe. Help me to overcome my unbelief. Yeah, I'm believing, but I need a little help here. Ezekiel 33, 31, God is saying about how the Jewish people come to the prophet, but they don't really listen. He says, my people, they come to you, as they usually do, and they sit before you to hear your words, but they don't put them into practice. Their mouths speak of love, but their hearts are greedy. Jesus says in John 14, 23 and 24, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me must obey my teaching. And you're thinking, well, who, did that, who the heck does he think he is? If you love me, you're going to obey me? That does not fly with my friends. My best friend, hey, go buy that Iron Man figure for me. <laughs> That's the only thing that came to mind. Right? And he said, what? Why should I do that? If you love me, you obey me. That is not going to fly. And it shouldn't. Who does Jesus think he is? God? But you know what? We do understand it because it's like a mom who's asking the kids, clean up your room, clean up your room. And they keep making more mess. And they come and, oh, mommy, we love you. If you love me, why don't you go clean up your room? If you love me, why don't you do what I said? God says, if you love me, you obey me. Don't just think you could check a box saying, yep, I love because I've got this warm, mushy feeling towards God. Put it into practice. My father, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them, 
and we will come to them and make our home with them. That's a pretty wonderful promise from Jesus. Anyone, Jesus wants to live in your home. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. That's pretty black and white. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. And I could also say this morning, this sermon, I hope, has been what we've been studying here in Scripture. This is not just stuff I'm making up and standing up front. This is not works righteousness. This is not earning your salvation. God, Father, or Son are not telling us, if you are good enough, I will save you. That's not what we heard. That is not even close to what we heard. He is saying that when God tells us to build our lives on the rock, and we don't build, but we build on quicksand, from heaven's point of view, it looks like we really don't have faith at all. Our construction, our home, may look pretty shoddy, but if it's built on that bedrock, it's going to weather the storms. He's saying that when God tells us to build our lives in the rock, that's what we do. We depend on God. I'm planting my flag here. Faith is more than mere intellectual assent. You don't get faith out of a theology book. You don't get true faith out of watching a documentary or sitting in a seminary class. Faith is trusting God. Pure and simple. Trying to get off that island because she's going to blow. Faith is grabbing hold of that rope when you're down in that pit. And even if we stumble and even if we fall, we know we're going to make it out alive because God's given us his guarantee. He's given us his promise, and God doesn't fail. Brothers and sisters, do you believe that? Amen. Lord, we believe. Please help us in our unbelief. Amen. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.